once again to Daily Manna. I am excited about the, this week and what God is going to help us to see. We're going to work through uh, chapter 15, the remaining part, and step into Acts 16 before the end of the week. So we're going to have a great time and our time of sharing and conversation. So welcome, and let's get started, and let's begin. We start today with Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 5. And we're moving down to verse 11. And so let's go quickly into the word of God and let's taste and see what he's saying. The Bible says that some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know how that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. And thus far, the word of God. Now, let's, as you well know, let's, let's kind of pull our minds back from last week. Um, here's exactly again what's happening. The Paul and Barnabas begin uh, their journey in a place called Antioch, and they've now traveled to a few places. In the midst of it, there have been persons who have responded to them negatively by trying to throw them out of town. Uh, Paul has hit, run into a situation where he has been stoned. Uh, he's gotten up and proceeded. And in each one of the cases, they continue to speak the gospel in varied places. Well, they're now going back to Jerusalem. And they're now given an account for their stewardship. It's almost like they are reporting to them what has happened. And during the reporting time, the scripture is showing us how the church or the established church at that in Jerusalem is struggling with what does it mean for someone who is not of their ethnic origin to be considered a part of their faith connection. So again, the ethnic origin, faith connection. So they're trying to see how the faith, how being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, how one outside of the ethnic uh, race is able to become a part of the community of faith. It's, so that's the struggle. And so what's happening here is there's this debate. And here's the debate. Can they be Christian and uncircumcised? They're, they're, they're wrestling with this because circumcision was a part of the covenant of what it meant to be a part of the quote unquote Christian community. So in their minds, they could not see how one could be now in the community of faith and outside of that covenant. They couldn't see it. So they struggle with it. And here's Paul saying to them that, look, we are not are going to put on them a yoke that we ourselves can't bear. We struggle with the whole idea of circumcision and what it does to our flesh and what it does to us. And since we ourselves have struggled with it, why would we all of a sudden now force them to do a practice that therefore that is a part of our ethnic orientation over again allow over against allowing them to receive Jesus as we did through faith? Thus, this begins, as you well know, if you studied the Bible at all a little bit, it then opens up the conversation that will later be between Paul and James, the questions between faith and works, and being able to distinguish that just because you do an action is not always a guarantee of your faith, 
And just like just because you have faith, an absence of your activity does not validate it as well. So you have this balance that's going to start coming to play between faith and works and what's happening ultimately is Paul wishes to say to them, I need your minds to move to what ultimately it means to be saved. Now, let's come back and bring it closer to home. During the time that quote unquote African Americans and Caucasians were living in an age where people of the African American diaspora were considered slaves and when their masters would go to church, they would make sure that their slaves was in the back of the church and sometimes in the balcony. But they struggled with their slaves who not only heard the word, were in a position where they could receive sacrament. So what started happening with the slave owner was psychologically they start trying to make this thing make sense. How can you be a slave and my brother? a slave and my sister, especially since the cup of communion brings us together or baptism makes us one. So they struggle with it. And ultimately the quote unquote, then Caucasian churches began being insistent that the person of the African American diaspora needed to have their own service in order for them to be separate because a part of the separation allowed them who were Caucasians to feel all the more quote unquote independent, segregated, distanced, detached from that which would be considered to be their African American brothers and sisters. Because we are not one because we are not connected by sacrament. Thus they could able to look down and put down and talk down. Thus, when you hear about a Martin Luther King in his letter from the Birmingham jail, making an appeal to them to have an appreciation for the struggle of their fellow Christians, it was hard for the Caucasian community to accept that message because they did not see themselves as equal in Christ because that which brought them together was sacrament, and as long as sacrament was separate, there was no unification of the body. And so they did not see a person who professes Christ who looked like me, and probably looks like some of you, not Christian because of the pigmentation of your skin and because they have separated through sacrament and also through what you might call the sacrament of communion and sacrament of baptism. That separatism, that divide calls for them to therefore have some distance. Now be careful now, as you still deal with this whole divide, this argument that's arising in Jerusalem that's carrying over, even as we listen to it to today's society. When I heard persons on January 6th praying after you know, viciously, you know, jumping in and raiding the Capitol. And they have the audacity to start praying? My mind said, well, who y'all praying to? Who, wh wh what are you doing? And yet they believed that they were talking to the same God that I talked to, but their minds were so warped that they basically believed that what they were doing was right. Now you ask me, I'm saying they're crazy as hell, get out. But to them, they felt justified and righteous in their actions. All because of how they viewed themselves in light of Christ. The biggest and most hardest thing for me to profess and confess is this. And sometimes I get angry about it. And that is throughout my lifetime, I have been taught a socialist gospel and a gospel that allows me to therefore be concerned about the least, the lost, the left behind, the marginalized, those who are put on the periphery. I've been taught to love them and been taught to love all and to basically work with all, which is the struggle for the African American community in our message of holism and health for our society because we believe the society of which we live needs healing. 
social justice is important. But it's hard to profess and to bring about social justice when sometimes the very people you got to love doesn't look like you, doesn't have the mindset of you, and you got to learn how to love them in their differences. We who are part of the African community have been taught to love people in differences while we have not seen that globally for the Caucasian community. They want to love separate. They want to love the divi only divided. They don't want to cross the line. They don't want to get to know. They do not want to find themselves coming together. Rather, don't come across the street to my side. Don't come to my neighborhood. Don't come here, stay away. I used to wonder why until I started reading this text. It's because all of us who want to stay separate are just too scared to get to know. May I challenge you on the other side of the screen? Get over your fear. Talk to somebody who doesn't look like you and accept the difference of their appearance and then recognize the God that you serve has accepted them long before you and has called them to a setting of holism without them having to come to your standards of acceptance. Don't measure yourself by your neighbor. Measure yourself by the Father. Thank you for your time. I love you. I'll see you tomorrow.